invite you to take your Bibles and turn, if you will, to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 is where we'll be this morning. And as you're turning there, you ought to know that our senior pastor, Clint Presley, is away. He is on the other side of the world in East Africa in the country called Mozambique. And there he is with a couple missionaries that are very connected to this church, Brian and Becky Harrell. So you be praying for our pastor as he is there ministering with a few other guys from our church. And he'll be back in the pulpit next Sunday. Now today, as we turn our attention to the Word, we're in the second week of a series that may, you may even wonder why we're doing this. We're in a series called the Five Solas. Now that word sola, that's a Latin word. And that word means alone. And these five solas, they were the five phrases that basically summarized, encapsulated the Protestant Reformation, which is really why we are here today. So last week, we looked at sola gratia, which is grace alone. Today is sola fide, faith alone. Next week will be solus Christus, which is Christ alone. And then we'll look at sola scriptura, the scripture alone, and we'll wrap it all up with soli deo gloria, to the glory of God alone. Now, don't let that Latin throw you off. You, it's really not important. You just need to know the, the meaning. The Latin, by the way, is really good for passwords. I used all five solas as passwords for all my random accounts over the years. That's one way you can maybe learn them. But what we want to focus on today is this. I don't use them anymore, so no luck. <laughs> These encapsulate the gospel. So what we're talking about, this is not ethereal. This isn't something that is just good to know. This is the faith. And so today, as we look at Romans chapter 3, I want, before we read, I want you to hear this. Sola fide, saved through faith alone. It is the heart of the gospel. This isn't just something to know. This is the gospel. Moreover, faith alone, this was the heart of the Reformation. If you're wondering why the Protestant Reformation even happened, it was primarily for today's point. You are saved through faith alone. Martin Luther, who was one of the main characters in the Protestant Reformation, he went so far as to say this, and I couldn't agree more. He said, what we're going to talk about today, sola fide, saved through faith alone, it is the article. It's the doctrine. It's the truth upon which the church stands or falls. And so today, as we turn our attention to Romans chapter 3, just to heap a little bit more emphasis on this, many commentators would say that Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26, the verses we will read, are the most important paragraph, not just in the book of Romans, not just in the New Testament, in all of Scripture. And you'll see why in a moment. So if you found Romans chapter 3, I invite you to stand with me as we read together God's Word. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. Paul writes, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. And it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Would you join me as we pray? Our Father, right now we come before you asking that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. The passage is dense and the subject matter is weighty. Indeed, this is the heart of of the Christian faith. And so impress it upon every heart in this room, including me today, I pray. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. You may be seated.
your greatest problem this very moment may not be what you think. Your greatest problem this very moment may not be what you feel right now. Many of you have come in today with a lot on you. Perhaps you're here and the only thing you can think about is your failing health, whether it be your physical health or perhaps your mental health is just throwing you for a spin. Some of you are here today and the greatest problem in before your eyes is the fact that you know your marriage is falling apart. Perhaps the wayward child you love so dearly is just sucking the life out of you. That's all you can think about. Perhaps money is so tight that it just feels like it's, it's taken all the life out of you and it's all you can fixate on. You know, the world seems to think that the greatest problem it has might be the environment. It could be the lack of education, maybe poverty, or even something as insidious as racism. But what I want you to hear, and I, I don't want you to take my word for it, I say this on the authority of this book in my hand. And I can say with full assurance that the greatest problem you have this very moment is that you are unable to stand to be reconciled to a holy God. Now, I want you to feel that because you may hear that and it just doesn't really seem to have the weight it ought. Your greatest problem this moment is that you cannot stand before God. Here's why. If there's one thing this book teaches, it is this. This book makes abundantly clear every page that we see, know, were created by, worship an unspeakably holy God. His holiness is a consuming fire, the Bible says. And you and I are so infinitely inferior. We are so infinitely unholy. We are so sinful that the Bible says you and I could never stand before the holiness of God. We could never come. We would be consumed by that fire. And you need to hear that perhaps one of the most righteous men in all the Bible, Job himself, Job cried out, I, I just don't understand. How can a man, how can a sinful man ever stand before a holy God? What hope do we have? That is a question you really ought to have weighing on your soul right now. What possible hope could we, men and women, so broken as we are, what hope could we possibly ever have? You see, this book in my hand, this book was not written ultimately to help you solve your temporal problems, although indeed it can. I don't mean to make light of the problems you brought in. I've, I bring in my own. But I want you to hear that this book was not de designed primarily to help you live a better life. It was designed to answer a far more relevant problem for you. It is given to us ultimately to show you the solution to your greatest problem. The greatest problem we have today is this. And it's the heart of this book, by the way. The heart of the Bible. The heart of Romans. The heart of this passage. The heart of this church. The heart of the Reformation. It was this. Here's the solution. God must do for you what you could never do for yourself. He must do for you. There is no other way. This is the truth upon which the church stands or falls. God must do something for you that you are utterly incapable of doing yourself. And today, as we look at Romans 3, in order to understand the weight and the glory of this truth, you need to see that Paul demonstrates for us, in just these few verses, he demonstrates to us three absolute truths that you've got to see. None of these are negotiable. 
You must see these things. And so, if you're taking notes, number one, hear this. Paul wants us to see that you must see your absolute inability. Look, if you will, at verse 23. For all have sinned. All have sinned. You English scholars in the room, you know what tense that is. It's past. Or if you're a Greek scholar, you know it's aorist. That all that means is it happened in the past. You come today as a sinner. And so I want you to hear just three things. Hear this. Paul, is. it's like if you ever go to a jeweler. You notice if they show you the diamond, they usually don't put the diamond on a white tray. What do they put it on? They tend to put it on a black velvet of some kind tray. Why? Because that black is going to show just how great and sparkly that diamond really is. And that's what Paul's doing in this text. He is laying the black velvet backdrop. What we're going to talk about just for a few moments, this is heavy and this is negative. But it is absolutely vital for you to see just how good Paul's good news is. And so, as Paul is laying this black backdrop, he is going to lay three things before our eyes. First off, when we think about our absolute inability, number one, you must know this, that you cannot... Be righteous in yourself. You cannot. Indeed, you are not righteous. Hear this. All have sinned. Have. You come today. There's not one of us in this room that has not done this. We come before this holy God and we stand condemned as sinners. If you just, we don't have time to read it all, but if you just look through the chap, uh, Romans chapter 1 through chapter 3, you're going to see that Paul just keeps hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting the same note. I do a men's Bible study on Tuesday mornings at Panera nearby, and we're in the middle of Romans chapter 2, and it's repetitive at this point because every paragraph we go to, Paul says the same thing. We have sinned. If you just look at chapter 3, just at another time, look at verses 10 through 19. They just give 14 different ways that we have fallen short. We stand as unrighteous men and women. And this is why this matters. Look, if you will, at chapter 3. Look at verse 19. The second half of verse 19 says, Since we've sinned, every human mouth should be stopped. And the whole world be held accountable to God. You and I have no defense. There is nothing we can bring. Now I know some of you may feel better than others. But hear this. There are some who stand at the bottom of the sea. And there are some who stand at the heights of the mountain peak. But neither is as close as the other to reaching to the stars. There is nothing we can do to reach the holiness of God. We are not righteous. All have sinned. There's one other thing he draws our attention to. Not only are we not righteous, number two, we cannot, you cannot earn it. You can't earn salvation. Look at the second half of verse 23. Not only does he say all have sinned, then he changes his tense and he says, and falls short. You English scholars will know once again that that's present. And all that means is this. You have sinned and you are sinning. You are falling short. It's like you are always falling short. This is crucial because works righteousness, this idea that somehow we can do enough good things to finally get God's approval, the idea that somehow we have enough good within ourselves to stand before a holy God eventually and in the great balance we we'll probably have more good than bad. This is a lie from hell. It is. This has been the Achilles heel of all mankind. This was the problem for Judaism. This is why Jesus spoke so passionately and Paul spoke so passionately to the Israelites of their day. They thought they could earn it. That was the catalyst for the book of Romans. This has been the problem not just for Judaism. This was the problem at the Protestant Reformation, the universal Catholic Church. This is what was happening. They really believed that you could do enough good things that your merit would, in the final analysis, earn you something with the God of the universe. That was the catalyst for the Reformation. 
It's not just the problem, though, for Israelites. It's not just the problem for Catholicism. This has been the problem for the whole world. All the world religions, they are all built, save Christianity, on this right here. That there is something you can do to get right with God. There's something you can do to make God be happy with you. And Paul wants you to see that this is impossible. You are absolutely unable to do this. This is our problem. Some of you today may be looking to the good things you do. And mercy, there are so many good things that happen in this country. In this congregation. And I want you to hear from God, of the God of the universe, that if you are looking to your good deeds as your assurance of salvation, this message is for you. Hear God say crystal clear. All have sinned and all of you are falling short. You are unable to earn it. And lastly, let this lay upon your heart. Not only are you not righteous? Not only can you not earn salvation, lastly, you cannot escape the wrath of God. Look, if you will, at the end of verse 23. Not only have all sinned, not only are we falling short presently, we have fallen short of the glory of God. What does that even mean? This is kind of pithy. It's easy for you to remember. If you want to understand Romans 3.23, look at Romans 1.23. 123, turn if you will to 123. It is a good explanation of what God is talking about. Because in Paul's harangue against all of our sin, in verse 23 of chapter 1, he says, We have exchanged the glory of God, the glory of the immortal God, and we have exchanged it for images. We have taken the perfect God of the universe and we have said, I don't want it. We have said, I want creation. I don't want the creator. I want this. And Paul says, this is the essence of sin. When you fall short of the glory of God, it's not just, oh, you tripped, you didn't quite make it. This is a awful reality. Every last one of us, we have sinned and we are presently sinning against the glory of God. And the Bible says when God's glory is exchanged, the wrath of God must not will, it must be revealed. You must feel this, that you cannot escape the wrath of God. We deserve it. The wages of our sin, the wages of our awful exchange is death. That is the wage. That's what you deserve. We cannot escape this judgment. We cannot. And the question we all ought to stand here and ask is this, if this is true, if I am totally unable, am I totally unable to do this? If I am not righteous, I have no hope of becoming righteous, and I have no hope of escaping the wrath of God, do I have any hope? What can I do? And the answer is, it's impossible. You cannot do anything. But with God, all things are possible. And this is where the glory of the gospel comes in. The velvet has been laid. And now let's take a look at this remarkable jewel. I want you to see not only that you are unable to do this, you are absolutely unable. I want you to see one other thing. Paul wants you to see one other thing. Number two, you must see Christ's absolute ability. So not only do you need to see your absolute inability, you must see Christ's absolute ability. And Paul shows us in verses 24 and 25 three different things that Jesus Christ alone can do for you that you could never do for yourself. These are three things that only Christ can do. So, number one, if you're taking notes, here's the first thing that only Christ can do. Christ alone can declare you and I righteous before a holy God. Look, if you will, at the first half of verse 24. In verse 24, he says, after we've fallen short of the glory of God, but we are justified by his grace as a gift. 
That word justify, circle it in your Bible, underline it, highlight it. This is a word you ought to know. When Paul says that we are justified before God, he is talking about one of the key, crucial, primary things Jesus did for you. So let's just think about this word justify. Perhaps you've seen it in its lengthened form, justification. The heart of the gospel. Don't spit that word out of your mouth. That word is your only hope. First off, this word, this act, it was a divine act or a passive act. Because if you notice, it says are justified. That means you didn't do it. You aren't the one doing the justifying. You have been justified. Jesus comes to you and he does it, you receive it. This is a work of God. And that alone is enough of a sermon. You can just glorify God that he alone can do this. And he has. He justifies. But it's not just a passive act. It is also a legal act. And here's what we mean by that. When you see that word justify, here's what it means. It's like a legal term saying, like a judge would say, you are declared innocent. Not just innocent, you are declared righteous. What is happening in this imagery is that the God of the universe, whom we will all stand before one day at the great judgment, he is looking at us. And the God of the universe is saying, I see you for who you are. You have fallen short. I see that. I see it. You have sinned. I see it. You have exchanged the glory of God. And I am looking at you in my gracious gift. I am looking at you and I am declaring you righteous. I am giving you a judgment right now. You are not guilty. Now the question is, is that just? Is it right for God to make a judgment like that? If a human judge did that, none of us would love it. Everybody gets worked up when somebody gets off innocent when you think they're guilty. How is this possible? Is this just God pretending our sin didn't exist? Some think that. Some think God is just such a chummy God that he just forgets about it. But the Bible says, no, 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 no. It is far more glorious than that. Because this is not just a passive act and it's not just a legal act. This is a just act. It is right. And here is why. It's not a just act because you deserve it. It's not a just act because you've done something to get it. It is a just act because when God takes that gavel and he says, you're justified, Kyler, you're justified, Kyler. Do you know why he's saying that? It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with somebody else. The reason justification is just is because God has looked at you and he has said, you know what? I am declaring you righteous because I am counting your faith as righteousness. I am seeing the trust you have in my son who was perfect, who never did anything wrong. Jesus is the antithesis of Romans 3.23. Jesus never sinned. He never fell short of the glory of God. Not a single time. And, G and the God of the universe is saying, I am seeing you for who you really are, Kyler. And I am putting my son Jesus in front of you. And I am declaring you righteous because of Jesus' righteousness. This is glorious. You may have heard the word imputed righteousness before. All it means, you don't have to hold on to that word. It just means this. The God of the universe has looked at you in your humble state and he is declaring you righteous because of his son. It is mind-blowing, it is amazing, and it is one last kind of act. It's not just passive. It's not just a legal or just act. This is a gracious act. Oh, it is so gracious. You aren't actually righteous. That's what makes this such good news is that we actually aren't righteous. We don't, nothing changes. When God justified me, I didn't instantly become just. Just ask my wife. I'm not. When God declared me righteous, he did it in spite of my sin. Which, by the way, was the heart of the Reformation. God wasn't making me righteous. He was merely declaring it. Oh, it is such glorious news that Jesus has done for me what I could never do for myself. 
This is the heart of the gospel. He alone can declare you righteous. Justification, it's a glorious word. But there's another word he uses. Another word you ought to know. Not only have we been justified, we have been redeemed. So if you're taking notes number two, he doesn't just, he, Christ alone can't just declare you righteous. Christ alone can pay your debt. And you'll see that in the second half of verse 24. Because he says, not only are we justified by his grace as a gift, this has happened through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now let's think about that word redemption. It's a very Christian word. It's one of those words that we can lose the import of because it's just said a lot. Think about this word. Redemption is a commercial act. Here's what I mean by that. It's what happens when you pay money to get something. Particularly, this is the imagery. It's like paying money to free somebody, perhaps a slave. It's paying money perhaps to ransom somebody who's a prisoner. This is what's happening. And Jesus is teaching us through the Apostle Paul. He is teaching us that what God did is he came to you in your enslaved sinful state. And he has paid for you something you could never pay for yourself. Remember, none of us can earn this. And what God did is he came and he paid it for you. It is a gloriously commercial act. He paid a price you couldn't afford. He ransomed you. And I want you to hear this, lest you think this is just some sort of bizarre exchange of money. This is not just a commercial act. It is a costly act. Oh, the cost is infinite. This is why. The cost to redeem you from your sin is a cost that the whole collective group in this room would never even get close to affording because the wages of our sin is death and not just sinful death. The only hope you have of escaping this is if a perfect sacrifice is made for you. Somebody has to be killed. Somebody has to die. Blood has to be spilt. That is righteous. That is perfect. And it isn't ours. That's what's so amazing about this is Christ alone can redeem you. He alone can do this. 1 Peter 1, 18-19 you were ransomed from the feudal ways you inherited from your forefathers. Not with perishable things such as silver or gold. Jesus didn't buy you with silver or gold. But with the precious blood of Christ. You must see your inability to earn this. And you must see Christ's absolute ability to redeem you. You have been justified, declared righteous. You have been redeemed. He has bought you with a price you couldn't pay. And lastly, Paul shows us there is one other glorious thing that Christ alone can do. He alone can remove God's wrath. He alone. Look, if you will, at verse 25. First half of verse 25 says, Whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood. Don't let that word scare you. I have taught that word to kindergartners, and you can too. It's a tough word to say. It's got a lot of syllables, but this is at the heart of the gospel. That word propitiation, let's just talk about what's going on right there. First off, this is a sacrificial act. Here's what's happening. When Jesus, uh, when Jesus propitiated your sin, propitiated the wrath of God, this is what he means. God is justly angry at sin. Just as we said at the beginning, he is a consuming fire. Holiness cannot be, uh, sinners cannot be before a holy God. He rightly, justly will punish sin. And the glorious good news of this passage is this, ladies and gentlemen. Watch it. What God did is he put forward Jesus as the one who would take his wrath away. Propitiation literally means to quench God's wrath, to absorb it, to take it away, to take it all so it's no longer on you. This was a sacrificial act. Jesus alone did it. The wages of sin is always death and Jesus died for your wages. Jesus did it. He took away, he alone removed God's wrath from you. It's a sacrificial act. Moreover, it is a substitutionary act. We all know that word, just like a substitute teacher who fills in for another. This is what Jesus did. 
He stood for you on that cross. When he was nailed upon that cross, he was taking God's wrath so that you wouldn't have to. And if that's an offensive thing to you, if you hear that and you're like, dear mercy, how is that possible? How could the wrath of God be coming down on Jesus? May I turn your attention briefly to Isaiah 53, a passage we all know well, we read so over so quickly. But hear this, Isaiah 53, just in verse 6 alone, that latter half of verse 6 says, The Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity, the sin of us all. God took all of our sin and he put it on Jesus. Now go down just a few verses. Isaiah 53 verse 10. Watch what happens next. And it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Oh, that is weighty and that is heavy. But what is happening right here is the God of the universe has put all of his wrath on his son who absorbed it all. He has propitiated God's wrath. He has removed the wrath we deserved. Jesus alone could do this. You must see your absolute inability. You cannot justify yourself. You cannot redeem yourself. You cannot remove God's wrath. But Christ alone can do these things. And so the final question we need to ask ourselves today, and this is crucial. The crucial question we must ask is this. How do Christ's abilities meet my inabilities. In other words, how is it possible? How does it work? How do I get those things that you just told me Jesus alone can do? What hope do I have that Christ will do for me what I could never do for myself? And this is the crux of the matter. The answer is this. Look at the last half of verse 25, a glorious final phrase. After he says it's been put forward as a propitiation by his blood, he says, to be received by faith. Faith. It is mere faith that gets you all of Christ's abilities that you are unable to do for yourself. It is mere faith. And so let's just end our time by thinking about that word. What does it mean? It's such a Christian term. It, it, we kind of throw it out there and sometimes it's hard to even remember what we mean by it. What is faith? Well, three things I want to lay on your heart to conclude our time together. As we think of faith, first off, I want you to think of this as a synonym of what the word faith means. First off, faith is trust. Specifically, trust Christ's perfect righteousness. You must see this. You must see, ladies and gentlemen, that faith alone is your absolute hope. Faith alone is your hope. And I want you to have this faith by trusting Christ's perfect righteousness. Now, the question we ought to be asking ourselves is, how can we who are not righteous ever stand before a holy God? How can we do it? And the answer is not by works, but by faith alone. You are not righteous. Christ can declare you righteous. And that happens when you trust his perfect righteousness. You see what happens when you have faith, it's like it unites you to Christ. You become one as it were. When God looks at you, he no longer sees you. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. It is just sheer wonder that this happens. And so when you stand before the God of the universe on that final day, I hope you don't bring anything in your hands. When you stand before God, you better not have anything there to say, look, here's what I did. All you'll be able to do in that final day is trust Christ's perfect righteousness. Pray, oh God, that when he sees you, he doesn't see you. He sees the blood of his son. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. So you must admit your inability to be righteous. You must, you really must trust that Christ alone can declare you righteousness. And guess what? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, you will be justified. Oh, it is merciful news. You must trust his perfect righteousness. Another way to look at faith would be this. Number two, receive Christ's gracious gift. Receive it. How can we, who are in infinite debt, ever hope to pay it off? How could we do it? The answer, of course, as you know, you could finish my sentence. It is not by works, but by faith alone. Only faith 
will make this possible. And here's how. Look, if you will, at verse 28 of chapter 3. It says this, you are justified by your faith apart from the works of the law. Jesus counts you righteous and it has nothing to do with anything you possibly did. Jesus pays for you what you could never pay for yourself. In other words, all faith is, is it's a disposition of receiving. It's, oh God, I'm trusting that you are righteous and I'm not. And I am just receiving this gift. You are justified. I'm justified by grace as a gift. And I just hold out my hand and I receive it. Oh God, I'm just receiving it. That is faith. And lastly, Trust His righteousness, receive His gracious gift, and believe Christ's unwavering promise. Believe it. And here it is. How can we, who are condemned, justly condemned before a holy God, how can we ever escape judgment? How is it possible? What hope do I possibly have? The answer, of course, is not by works, but by faith alone. It is to be received by faith alone. One of the most glorious promises in the Bible is Romans 8 verse 1 because it says when you are in Christ there is therefore now no condemnation. None. When you put your faith in Christ you are united to him and now the holy God of the universe that consuming fire he looks at you and he says you are no longer condemned. You stand justified before him. It's like this. It is honestly like Jesus himself has wrapped his arms around you and he can now carry you into the consuming fire of the holiness of God. And you stand able to be reunited with him. We are reconciled to him now because of this. We can become friends of God thanks to Jesus. And so to receive this by faith, you've got to believe his unwavering promise. Believe it this moment. That you are not condemned if you believe. Right now, you stand justified. Right now, you stand redeemed. Right now, God's wrath has been removed from you. And there are many of you in this room right now who perhaps a lot of what I've just shared has been new to you. Perhaps this is the first time you've ever heard something like that. And you may just know with assurance, Kyler, I, I hear you. God's got to do something for me that I've never... I've never been able to do for myself. How do I know if this has happened? If that's you, I want you to hear the call of God. You must trust Him. Trust that He can do this. You must receive it. Just, just receive it. Just cry out to God and say, Oh God, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know that you can hear me, but I'm just receiving this right now. I hear you. I believe this. And you must just believe His promise. Just stand on it. Just stand no matter what voices you hear and say, I am trusting you, oh God, I am believing this. But I suspect that the majority of us in this room, perhaps the way we respond to this is a little different. Perhaps you hear this and you think, you know, uh, is my faith real? That's a good question to ask, by the way. Some of you may be thinking, you know what, I need to try harder. I need to trust God more. It's a good thing. I, I, need to, I need to make sure my faith is stronger, okay? You may be thinking, if I'm saved by faith alone, I, I gotta make sure my faith is a little bit better here. And I want you to hear this. This is the last thing I wanna share with you. Dr. D.A. Carson, he's a well-known New Testament professor. Anything he writes, you ought to read. Very, very uh, good guy. He once gave this little illustration and it struck me. Imagine you were one of the Israelites in Egypt, right as the Passover was about to happen. That first Passover was when they put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their house so that they would escape the angel of death. And so there's two Israelites standing there talking to each other. One of them says, oh, I am scared to death. I, I've, I've put the blood up here. I, I, I'm trusting that God told me to do this, so I've done this, but this is my only boy. I don't want to lose my child. I'm scared. I'm nervous about this. The other Israelite who's talking to him says, oh, I'm, I'm not scared. I have full confidence. God's going to do it. I'm not worried at all. And let me ask you, dear church, which one of those guys was passed over? Which one of those guys lost their son? The answer is neither lost their son. 
The answer is both were passed over. Why? Because it is not the strength of your faith that saves you. It is the object of your faith that saves you. We are not saved by our faith alone. We are saved through faith alone. The one who saves us is Jesus. Jesus is our assurance. And so if you are struggling right now, if you are wondering if it's real, my call to you is not to look back at a time you prayed. My call to you is not to look back at the good things you did this week. It is this very moment. Look to Jesus. He is your assurance. You look to him right now and you never forget it. Your faith is not what saves. Your faith is not what saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Would you join me as we pray? With your heads bowed as we go to the Lord in a time of response, which is biblical and right. You have just heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard it before. Indeed, you hear it every week. But you've just heard it in great detail. And this message demands a response from each of us. Everyone in this room must respond some way. Perhaps those of you today may be wondering whether or not you've ever trusted him. If that's you, my call to you is that in a moment we'll sing. There'll be some men and women down here at the front that would love to show you what God has done for them that they could never do for themselves. And if you do know that you have saving faith, but you recognize you've been battling assurance, perhaps you need to pray with somebody. I encourage you to do that. And I want to call you now to trust in Jesus, who alone can save you. And what a gracious way he does it. It is through faith. Would you join me as we pray? Lord Jesus, right now we do ask that you would do what we cannot. Open our eyes to behold you. Oh God, would you make us men and women who see that you alone are our only hope. We praise you now, oh Jesus, for you alone are our Savior. You alone are our only hope. We receive it by faith with thankful hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you join me and stand as Gerald leads us? The invitation to you is to come.